Hello everyone, my name is Minhal and I'm a PhD student in Professor Mark Wilson's group in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Toronto. And today I wanted to talk to you about the recent work I've just completed where we've used subband gap modulation to alter the blinking statistics in quantum dots and modify the power loss slopes. Briefly, the materials we're looking at here are well known to undergo blinking or fluorescence in intermittency, whereas you can see on the left in the green and blue traces, their emission intensity varies erratically between these two high and low states. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we detect such changes and what we've done to be able to modify this observable. Before I get into things, we need to know what a quantum dot is. Quantum dots are nanoscale objects typically made from semiconductor materials and occupy the intermediate space between bulk semiconductors and molecules. And the point is we really get the best of both worlds. Like a bulk semiconductor, we get the advantage that any photons matching or exceeding the band gap energy can be absorbed, and there's a large density of states above and below the band gap. We also get the nice property of molecules that typically we just have the one emitting state. And you can see these two properties demonstrated on the right in the spectra I show. The solid lines show you the absorption spectra, absorbing all the wavelengths across the visible. And the dashed lines show that nice narrow emission I was talking about. The last point I'd like to make about quantum dots is that the cartoon on the bottom, we can actually tune where the optical features lie in the spectrum of these dots just by changing their physical size, which is something synthetic chemists have figured out how to do pretty robustly and pretty reproducibly. If that wasn't motivation enough, hopefully we all know that quantum dots are great fluorophores. We use them for LEDs. We can use them for biomedical imaging. In my lab, one of my colleagues here in the middle is using them as triplet sensitizers for excitonic upconversion. And so just a quick overview of the materials we're using today. It's the canonical system we use to study blinking, a core of cadmium selenide overcoated or shelled with zinc sulfide, and then passivated with these long organic ligands. Before I get into the technicals, I just wanted to point out a little funny thing, which is that we can only really see blinking on a single quantum dot scale. And so here in the middle, I have a simplified schematic of the microscope we use to image these things. And on the right, an actual photo of the microscope in action. And what this instrument does for us is that we raster scan an excitation spot across the sample and collect the photons emitted from the sample. And we can actually zoom in on where we saw a lot of the photons and what we find is a single quantum dot. In fact, we can be quantitative about if we found a single emitter or not, but we won't get into that here. And so what we do once we find a single quantum dot is monitor its fluorescence intensity as a function of time. And so here I'm just showing you an example of this where we on the y-axis have the fluorescence intensity of a single cadmium selenide quantum dot under continuous wave excitation. And what you see here is that the signal rapidly and randomly switches between these two high and low states. If we zoom in on this red box that I've outlined here, we can see that it continues in a self-similar fashion over many, many time scales. And so the way we analyze this data is to threshold the intensity traces I've indicated with this red dash line. We assign any signal above the threshold to the on state and below to the off state. We can also histogram the fluorescence intensity and we get this bimodal distribution, which shows us we're switching between these two states. After thresholding, we find the frequency of the durations of each on and off event and plot them to generate a probability distribution. If we plot the probabilities in a log log plot, we get something unexpected. Typically, as physical chemists, we're used to working with exponentially distributed quantities and first order kinetics, but instead we see something that looks like a power law and extends over many orders of magnitude in time and in probability. Something to note about this distribution, if you look in the literature, is that the slope of this distribution, the alpha value, is usually centered around 1.5. Additionally, the durations of the off events are not truncated on timescales that we can see experimentally, but things get a little weirder when we look at the on state. We still have this power law decay, but the on state does come with an exponential truncation. The implication here is that the dots will turn off in the long time limit if I continue exposing them to the laser, which is obviously detrimental if we're using quantum dots as fluorophores. It turns out that this phenomenon of randomly switching between on and off states has been known for quite a while, but the mechanism remains unclear. And so one of the earliest proposed mechanisms, and certainly that we, something that we can concur as part of the problem, is Auger recombination. So even though we try to gently excite these things such that we only put one exciton into the dot at any given time, what happens just probabilistically is that we end up putting in two excitations into the dot. Instead of both of them recombining to give us two photons, what can happen is that one of them will recombine first, and instead of emitting that photon, transfers that energy to the other electron hole pair. 
This can end up ejecting one of the carriers and now we're left with a charge hanging around in the core. Subsequent excitations then, instead of emitting a photon, can recombine and give the energy to that charge that's left hanging around. And this continues to quench subsequent excitations. And it's not until its partner charge comes back, neutralizes it, and then we get back to our normal emission. It turns out that for a couple reasons, this type of mechanism is not enough to explain the quantitative features of blinking, but certainly this is one of the earliest mechanisms. And so the experiment we wanted to do was to find a new observable, find a new handle to investigate what's really going on with blinking. Historically, we've only been able to really look at the fluorescence of quantum dots. That's been the dominant observable. We were looking to augment this observable, do something with the fluorescence that can give us more insight into what's going on and ultimately get a mechanistic handle on what's causing blinking. And so the idea I had was to use a depletion beam tuned to the stimulated emission transition in these particular dots to see if we could perturb their blinking. And so here on the top right, I show you the absorption and emission spectra, and then in red, the spectrum of the beam I chose to deplete the band edge carriers with the hope that any blinking we see will then comment on the contributions from hot carriers because in literature, hot carriers have been shown to make blinking worse. And so we chose a wavelength to minimize direct, direct excitation of the dot, and hopefully we're able to look at the photons coming from the dot without too much laser scatter. And so we did the experiment, and this is what the data looks like. Here in the low periods, I'm showing you what I have with just the excitation laser on, and we see regular binary blinking, just as we'd expect. And then in the high periods, I have both the excitation and the modulation laser on at 637 nanometers. And it looks like the same binary blinking, except with this increased background that I'll get to in a second. And so to analyze this data, we can split the photon streams into modulated and unmodulated components and proceed with our regular blinking analysis. We'll threshold the intensity traces, generate the histograms, and what you can see here, which is quite important actually, is that the bimodality remains not just in the unmodulated data, but in the modulated data. Unfortunately, sometimes things aren't that simple. And here I show you an example of another experiment that we ran. However, this time, the background during modulation was clearly drifting. So obviously then, it's incorrect for me to use a constant intensity threshold in this case. And so what we did is develop the background subtraction algorithm that could flatten out the background. And so we'd be able to compare the modulated and unmodulated data equivalently. And so here you can see in red our algorithm tracking the drifting background, which is then subtracted off to give us the trace below. We get a nice flat trace and evidence for this working is that when we regenerate the histograms of the intensity distributions, you can see that the bimodality is still there. To really be able to compare properly, what we did decided to do is to subtract off all of the off counts such that the intensities are centered about zero. We did this because we figured when the dot is off, the majority of the photons that we're seeing is laser bleed through and doesn't really comment on the photophysics of the dot. So after the subtraction, what we find then is that the dot is a little bit darker, giving us less photons when the modulation is on, which is evidence for us being able to deplete the band edge carriers. We can actually be a bit more quantitative about this and have a look at the changes in brightness when the dot is on and how much the dot is on. So on the left, I'm showing you what I've called the differential brightness which is what you see on the bottom there, the modulated intensity minus the unmodulated intensity, all divided by the unmodulated intensity. What we see is that indeed the PL is dimmer during modulation. The other thing we did is check the on fraction of the dots, which is not quite the same thing. And what this is is the amount of time that the dot is on reference to the total duration of the experiment. So what the white squares are showing you is the amount of time the dot was on when I'm not modulating, and what the brown squares are showing you is the amount of time the dot was on when I am modulating, so both with the excitation and modulation laser. Again, you can see that in almost all cases, the dot was off more when I had the modulation laser on. And so this was a hint to us that something really was happening and was worth analyzing more carefully. So after the background subtraction and cursory statistics, we can histogram the durations, just like I talked about earlier, do our regular blinking analysis. And what we find is that the off state looks unaffected. So here in the blue is the modulated data and in the green, the unmodulated data, we got almost identical slopes. They look about the same and roughly the value that we'd expect. But interestingly, when we look at the on data, we get something that we didn't expect, which is that the power loss slope for the modulated data increases. And they increase quite a bit, which is something that we didn't predict at all. 
We thought it would just be the truncation times that would be affected, given that this is just another beam being added into the mix. And I should mention that when we ran our background subtraction, what we did was look at the local background around each point, which is for us the 100 bins immediately before and after any given point. But you can see that this presents the risk of truncating any long on times. In particular, for us, it meant that any on events longer than 10 seconds would get truncated by the background subtraction, meaning the dot would look off after 10 seconds, and this would give rise to exactly the effect that we thought we were seeing. And so just to make sure things were real, we first pre-screened all the intensity traces, and if we found any durations that were longer than 10 seconds in the on state, we used the 100 preceding and following points that didn't have any long on times to subtract off a local background. I should mention that this was only relevant for about 0.6% of the cases. We did our best to be careful because when you get a bigger slope in the data, we have suppressed on times and we really wanted to make sure the effect is real. And so to add some statistical significance to this, I decided to try this on 20 different dots and this is what we see. So here I'm showing you the fitted off slopes for these 20 dots in green again without modulation and blue with modulation. And I've plotted them in increasing order of unmodulated slope. What we see here is that the modulated slope really is unaffected. The blue circles are pretty equally distributed above and below the green circles. If you look at the averages on the right, we see that indeed the slopes are statistically indistinguishable. By contrast, looking at the on slopes, we see a clear increasing trend. So this data is for the exact same dots as you see below. And again, the green circles are plotted in increasing order. But now the corresponding modulated or blue data appears to lie above the unmodulated data in almost every case. Again, looking to the right, we see a very clear change in the average slope. Additionally, if you look at the red dashed line, what it's showing you is the average effect of the modulation. So if you take the unmodulated slope and add that to the average slope change, you get the red line, which seems to broadly line up with the observed, un with the observed modulated data. To be sure this is a real effect, we repeated the same experiment with another laser, this time shifted to 785 nanometers in wavelength so that it has no overlap with any spectral features that I can see in the UV of the dots. As you can see in the figure at the bottom, in the red circles, at all the modulation powers we looked at, the 785 nanometer beam didn't do anything. We also checked the intensity dependence at the 637 nanometer beam, and there's some evidence to suggest the effect may be nonlinear, but this is something we're still kind of working on. Turning back to the on slopes, we noticed that the change at our highest modulation power seemed to be characteristic. It seemed to affect every dot the same way, regardless of what the initial slope was, and seemed to have the same amount of effect each time. The effect also looks to be scale free, given that it increases almost the same for each dot. And you know, we started this experiment thinking that any changes we saw would be via a stimulated emission mechanism, but it's really not obvious to me how that would give rise to an effect like this. We figured initially that any extra, any extra excitations would just change the truncation time, maybe speed it up, because we know in literature that higher excitation rates or bluer wavelengths tend to do this to the dots. But when we looked at the truncation times, they all looked the same. We really didn't see any change. So in terms of mechanism, I don't think it's enhanced by exciton generation or any other processes like this, because again, looking at the truncation times, we really don't see anything. Um, and I did do the calculations to check how much the modulation beam contributes to the direct excitation, how much it contributes to the biaxiton generation, and I really don't think that's the effect that we're seeing here. In terms of a microscopic mechanistic origin, I'm really not sure, but we started thinking about the Marcus diffusion controlled model and whether the subband gap modulation can perhaps perturb the diffusion of the quantum dot energy levels, maybe change the slopes in this way. But this last point is very tentative and it's something we've just started thinking about. And so just to wrap up, I hope I've shown you that we can take advantage of the characteristic intermittency and dynamically subtract that background, isolate the effects of subband gap modulation, and hopefully we have a new handle here on examining the mechanism behind blinking. As a result, I think even just qualitatively, we can see that long duration on events are suppressed, the changes look to be scale free, selective to the on state, and hopefully robust to our methods of statistical analysis. And so I'd like to thank my group, my professor, Mark W.B. Wilson, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.